all right hello guys welcome back to the channel in today's video i'm going to be taking you through this question that i did with my students just last night and i thought the question was actually a good one to use as an example to show you how to answer questions this is step to seek your question but step one students can benefit from it like i always say on your exam if you're able to answer 80 90 percent of all the questions that ask you for diagnosis correctly you're probably going to be passing that exam pretty well and of course you're going to need to answer other questions as well if you want to score very high on the exam so you can pause the video try to answer the question pick an answer let me know what your answer was in the comments i'll give you two seconds and then i'm going to jump into the question myself and while you're doing that you can give the video a thumbs up you can like you can subscribe if you have any questions of course you can put them down in the comments as well i will jump in now i hope you have picked your answer okay a 65 year old man with non ischemic cardiomyopathy comes to the office due to two weeks of progressive shortness of breath and non productive cough. A 65 year old man with non ischemic cardiomyopathy comes due to what? Two weeks of progressive shortness of breath and non progressive cough. Lesson 101. And this is also a lesson that you're going to learn. One of the most important things I emphasize in the test taking mastery course. When you read vignettes, you read the first line of the vignette and you must pause you have to pause and you have to come up with differential diagnosis you have to pause and you have to come up with differential diagnosis so if i tell you that someone had with a, a history of ischemic cardiomyopathy comes with two weeks of progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough what comes to mind the majority of students will start with heart failure That's the first thought of majority of students, the first thought of my students as well, which informed her decision to pick the answer that she picked. And a lot of people picked her answer as well. But I want you to write this down and I want you to know this. Whenever you're giving someone with progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough, progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough, I want you to think of interstitial lung diseases. Once you are given a person with progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough, I want you to think about interstitial lung diseases. And when I say interstitial lung diseases, I need you to be thinking of things like sarcoidosis. I need you to be thinking of you know, pulmonary fibrosis. Right? Your pneumoconiosis. silicosis asbestosis all of those those guys will fall under what i would consider interstitial lung diseases these are what you should be thinking about when you're given progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough the duration of time is important of course someone said how about pneumonia well that's 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 that would take us to a whole other lecture now so we are going to try to focus here two weeks of progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough I will be, you'll be thinking heart failure, perhaps the average student will think heart failure, but you should also consider interstitial lung diseases. One week ago, he was instructed to increase his furosemide dose, but it did not seem to help. So what, what is that telling you? As you progress through the vignette, you are supposed to use the information you are given to rule out information or rule in information. So let's say I had come up with five differential diagnoses out of the first line of this question. When you tell me give me additional information i'm supposed to start narrowing down my differentials which is basically what doctors do in practice right that is the same thing you should be doing when you're answering your question as you as you get additional information going through the vignette you start ruling down narrowing down your differential and by the time you get to the end of the question one of the differentials will stick out as the correct answer and many times you realize that the questions are rather obvious or more obvious than they seem to be one week ago, he increased his furosemide dose. It did not seem to help. So, are you still thinking that this may be heart failure? Or are you now wondering, it's probably not heart failure. He had no chest pain or autopnea. He did not have autopnea. Furosemide did not help. He did not have a chest pain. So, he, he did not have another ischemic episode, perhaps. He takes all his medications as directed and comes to all of his clinic visits. The patient had a myocardial infarction five years ago and has severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction of 20%. So he does have some sort of heart failure. He has an automatic implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. Six months ago, he was hospitalized 
um, with recurrent AICD shocks due to ventricular tachycardia. He was successfully treated with antiarrhythmic therapy, which he is currently still taking. He is a febrile. His blood pressure is normal and his pulse is fine, regular. His mucous membranes are moist. His jugular veins are flat. Again, is it heart failure? While he is in a seated position, bilateral inspiratory crackles are heard on auscultation. There are no cardiac murmurs, no significant peripheral edema, just x-ray reviews bilateral lung infiltrates involving primarily the middle lung fields. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's current symptoms? There is a line in this vignette that I read quickly without emphasis just to not give off anything at all. On your exam, and this is something you should know, when they tell you that the patient was successfully treated with a particular therapy and is still taking the therapy but they don't tell you the name of the therapy, then you should automatically know that perhaps they want to ask you about that concept. Whenever a vignette is elusive to a particular detail, that is probably what they want to talk about. When they say that the person's vaccination status is unknown, perhaps they are testing you on vaccination. If they tell you that a person's family history is not known, then they are probably asking you about a familial or genetic disease. You want to bear these in mind. When they don't tell you about someone's occupation, whenever they, they make statements that suggest they are not telling you something, then you want to know straight away that they are probably testing that concept. So when they tell you he took furosemide, furosemide has not helped, they told us he takes all his medications as directed. You would notice if you've done a lot of UOL questions that they usually give you the list of medications. The patient is on thiazide diuretics, he's on hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, metformin, whatever medications the patient is taking. But here they tell you that he's successfully treated with antiarrhythmic therapy, which he is currently still taking. But they did not tell you what antiarrhythmic it was. So when you're reading a vignette and you see something like this, you ought to pause and ask yourself, well, what antiarrhythmic perhaps is this patient taking? You want to what you, you should wonder. It's, it's like you're talking to a real patient and the patient says, Oh, I, I've been taking this antiarrhythmic and it's been helping me. I'm still taking it. The next question a doctor is going to ask is, well, what's the medication? Do you remember the name of it? Did you come with it, right? So that's the same thing with this vignette here. He was successfully treated with antiarrhythmic therapy. He's currently still taking the medication. So we should wonder what this medication is. He's a febrile. He does not have a fever. So pneumonia is probably off your list of differentials. When you think of all of this, and then they also told you that his chest x-ray reviews bilateral lung infiltrates involving the middle lung fields. What does that suggest? For a lot of students, when you think of lung infiltrates, when you think of lung infiltrates, majority of students just think of pulmonary edema of some sort, something of that nature. But you want to also think of pulmonary fibrosis because on x-ray how do you differentiate um, infiltrates just in the vasculature from pulmonary fibrosis itself when you look at people with heart failure you're going to see prominent vasculature right cephalization kelly b lines and all of those things but when you look at a person with pulmonary fibrosis you also see prominent markings on the lungs and oftentimes on your exam they would describe all of these things as pulmonary infiltrates and in fact i will tell you in the early phases of pulmonary fibrosis you have actual pulmonary infiltrates that's a a concept we can probably look at some other time when you put all of these together what do you think in these among these options best explains this patient's presentation he's taking an antiarrhythmic that they would not tell us about is there perhaps an antiarrhythmic agent you can think about that has something to do with progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough? Can you think of any of your antiarrhythmic medications that would cause pro progressive shortness of breath and non-productive cough? You can run through your list of antiarrhythmics, class 1A medications. Any of the class 1A, quinidine, procainamide, disopyramide, class 1B, lidocaine, mexilatin. Now you think, does any of them cause shortness of breath no class 1c flicanide tokenide does any of them cause um propafenone does any of them cause shortness of breath not really how about class 2 antiarrhythmic they are beta blockers do they cause shortness of breath no how about class 3 drugs sotalol amiodarone amiodarone right 
if you thought amiodarone, you're correct. Remember that amiodarone was a class 3 antiarrhythmic agent and amiodarone caused pulmonary toxicity, pulmonary fibrosis. And that would explain this patient's non-productive cough. And so the correct answer to this question here is going to be an antiarrhythmic toxicity. Pay attention on your exams to the very first line. And this is the most important concept in test taking mastery. The first line of the vignette is the most important part of the vignette. You must come up with differentials right off the bat on the first line of the question. Two, three, four, five differentials from the first line of the question. You need to hold those ideas, hold those differentials in your mind. Don't forget about them. And as you read the vignette, you want to filter through the differentials to know which of them satisfies your question the most. A lot of students and my students picked advanced heart failure here and missed this question. I hope this was helpful to you. What did you pick as your answer initially? Let me know in the comments. I hope you've learned something here. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Leave a like, leave a subscribe. Send this video to somebody that is preparing for their step to secure exam and you may just help them prepare a little better. Until next time, I'll see you all in the next video. Catch you soon.